Thank you. Cheers, Adam. Um, well, um, I, I come to archaeology as a visitor. It's, um, uh, it's not uh, my, my field of expertise, but um, uh, my PhD is uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, interdisciplinary. It's um, in English and history. I deal with aspects of archaeology and anthropology uh, when I, I, I look at the categories used um, to refer to uh, certain uh, areas of the Near East, to um, certain peoples. Um, and certainly this is the subject of my paper today. So I'll be tracing the, um, um, uh, the categories and the signifiers used to refer to the inhabitants of the Near East um, uh, back to where they, they, they started and um, uh, the, the problems uh, that we have until uh, today in terms of um, uh, um, how we refer to the region in general. Um, uh, to start, my, I'll, I'll try to share my PowerPoint, although I'm not entirely sure um, how this uh, this is right here. Uh, share screens, yes. Yeah. So I'm hoping that that's okay. Been as, okay, it's working. Yeah. 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 So, great. Uh, so there are some very lengthy calls. I'll start by introducing my research. Um, uh, some very lengthy quotes here, which obviously I'll not be reading them, uh, so I'll, I'll leave them on some of the slides uh, on the PowerPoint here, or at least parts of them, um, uh, while I'm uh, explaining uh, uh, the, their importance uh, to what I'm talking about. So, um, arguments of a perpetual dichotomy between East and West, uh, though ungrounded in fact, have been read and resurrected over every major conflict concerning the two homogeneous entities. Today, such premises mostly pass unquestioned. It does sound perfectly natural and current to discuss the problems or differences between East and West as though they were two countries with distinct borders, not ideological cons concepts uh, and constructs that transcend the definitions of geography and ethnography. It is the formulation of such mythical ideological conceptions of Near Easterners uh, or the inhabitants of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and North Africa um, uh, that I trace here, beginning from their early becoming at the time of the Crusades and up to the, uh, their resurrections in early uh, modern England. I visit each of the imagined figures uh, of the Near Easterner within European and specifically English imagination. So these are, as in the title of the paper, the Saracen, the Moor, uh, um, uh, whether Barbary or Morocco, uh, as well as the Turk of the Ottoman Empire and ending by the Arab. Starting with the, the first section, so the Saracens part. Uh, this is a quote from um, uh, uh, Pope uh, Urban II's speech in 1095. Uh, I'm putting only part of it here. There's a, about two pages uh, of it that are of importance, but I'll just uh, 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 share with you a couple of them here uh, in two slides. Um, in 1095, uh, Pope Urban II gave a speech to a gathering of French and German bishops and princes, as well as a crowd of the public, in a central French town called Clermont. Um, his famous speech, uh, 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 besides being influential in mobilizing the First Crusade, uh, it also played a great role in fa founding the formulation of the Christian West uh, versus Islamic East divide. Um, uh, part of the quote, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to read here, but part of the uh, uh, quote is, is now on the slide. I, I hope you can see that. Um, uh, uh, what Urban II is describing here um, is clearly the Arab conquest of the Levant. And some of what he says about the loss of vast territories of Byzantium, um, uh, or the kingdom of the Greeks, as he calls it, is not too far from the truth. There are many falsifications and incorrectness uh, in what he says, nevertheless, which I shall return to in my analysis later. In the meantime, I shall uh, tackle uh, a specific historical inconsistency in the report Urban II refers to. Speaking in the late 11th century, Urban relates the incidents above as news, although the Arab conquest itself took place in the early 7th century and its political uh, unity had started to break up by the 10th century and with rival caliphates appearing in Egypt and Spain. Urban, however, had his motives for doing so, being holy pope in 1095. He could see his uh, subjects torn by internal wars and economic strife. Phillips explains uh, uh, in Urban's mind the fundamental cause of such chaos was a diminution of faith. 
The solution was a, a holy war, is a peer would unite the warring European factions and knights around a common enemy. Uh, this is another uh, part of, of, of the court. Second, in the process um, of creating a new conflict, Urban II utilizes the sworn seeds of a much older one. He claims that those who defiled the churches of God are a race from the kingdom of the Persians. The churches and territory uh, which have been dismembered were possessed by uh, the kingdom of the Greeks or Byzantium, the Greek Orthodox uh, Empire. Thus, he is resurrecting here the old argument of Persian versus uh, Greek, which was a result of the Greco-Persian uh, Wars, um, and bringing it back from antiquity to aid him in creating um, a, a new conflict, but on a much larger scale. Uh, it is worth noting here that a similar conflict, albeit within a different framework, must have been known relatively recently to the educated elite. Considering the rivalry between Byzantium and Persia, which existed before the Arabs uh, claimed much of the two competing empires. Um, third, he, um, Urban II deploys, in addition, the Turk versus, Col uh, versus Frank conflict, invoking the greatness of the great French King Charles, who reinstated the fragmented Roman Empire under his reign in 800 AD and ruled much of its former territories. Uh, the kingdoms of the Turks, to which Urban refers here, must be a reference to the Avars, being the only pagan kingdoms encountered by Charlemagne on the eastern fringes of Europe. Nevertheless, Urban's use of the term Turk, rather than the widely used Avar, for the sole reason of uh, weaving the conflicts between the former regions of the last reign of the Roman Empire and its neighbors uh, against what he called uh, Mohammedans or Saracens, uh, fourth, um, Urban II adds a whole new dimension to the old conflicts by claiming that the invaders depopulated these lands. And the depopulation concept here is, is vital because um, we come across this problem over, uh, uh, like the signifier problems, we come across it uh, uh, over and over and over again, um, especially with, with the Crusades coming back to claim Jerusalem and so on. Uh, this um, argument is entirely lacking in foundation, and the majority of the local uh, populations were either forcibly converted or put under pressure to choose to convert to Islam. Um, but Urban was skillfully justifying war of the highest level by denouncing the populations of the Levant, their former, or perhaps their contemporary faiths. As Phillips asserts, Urban and his circle of advisors constructed a case whereby violence could be seen as a morally positive act. The first crusaders rejoiced in massacring the population of Jerusalem, perhaps in an attempt to reverse the depopulation which they understood had taken place previously. Thus, Urban's merging of the two ancient conflicts, the Greeks and the Persians on the one hand, and Charlemagne and the Avars on the other, into one larger feud creates the illusion of an ephemeral conflict that has always existed parallel, if not identical, to the eternal conflict between good and evil within Christianity itself. Moreover, the struggle for power and territory, which has always plighted human civilizations of all shapes and kinds, served to skillfully establish the novel divide between two newly formulated uh, entities, Saracens and a cursed race, a race wholly alienated from God versus race of France, who are beloved and chosen by God. They are the two homogeneities of East and West, which to a large extent forge the Western sense of identity accepted, celebrated today. So moving on to the uh, second section, which is uh, the Turks part. Uh, the linguist Jack Derrida explains in structure, sign and play um, um, that um, uh, um, uh, th uh, this field, which is language, is in fact uh, that of free play, that is to say, a field of infinite substitutions. In the closure of a finite ensemble, this field uh, permits these infinite substitutions only because it is finite. That is to say, because instead of being an inexhaustible field, as in the classical hypothesis, instead of being too large, there is something missing from it, a center which arrests and founds the free, pl uh, free play of substitutions, which is exactly what happens with the signifiers that I'm talking about. Such infinite substitutions occur within the cycle of sign, signified, and signifier, um, which uh, Ferdinand de Saussure also uh, mentions. 
I shall um, argue here that the image of the inhabitants of the Near East, appropriately called the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa, continued to hold the same characteristics, but under different consecutive signifiers. So it was pretty much the, the same trope, but the word would change. So at one time it's Saracen, at another time it's Turk, then we go on to bar, uh, Barbarian, more, um, and then Arab. But the, the content, the connotation, is, uh, remains the same. Um, like all substitutions, they went through a transitional period when they were used interchangeably, for example, or rather synonymously, until Turk became more dominant. It is perhaps worth noting here that the term Saracen itself is debatable in regards to its origins and why it came to represent Near Eastern peoples in medieval times. The Oxford Dictionary uh, uh, traces uh, the origin or the etymology of um, the word Saracen uh, from the old French Sarazin, uh, via late Latin from the late Greek Sarakinos, and then uh, from Arabic uh, Sharki, uh, which means Eastern. I find this completely unconvincing. Um, uh, and I, um, the, 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 uh, in, I, I can read within this as well the, the, the influence of the colonial structures um, uh, that created this homogeneous attitude toward the, 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 the region. Um, there isn't, uh, the, the origin does not seem um, uh, con quite convincing here, particularly because the second syllables of the Greek and Arabic origins are completely different from the French and the English counterparts. Um, 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 and not just that, uh, Sharki does not sound the same at all as, as uh, Saracen. Um, um, a recent fr French TV program, however, suggests a much more uh, plausible origin to the word, uh, uh, which the French uh, Institut du Monde Arabe uh, endorsed on their website as well. Uh, uh, Saracen, um, or Saracen in French, has two meanings, um, uh, buckwheat and an individual Saracen. According to the French series, nos ancêtres Saracen, the buckwheat meaning superseded the Saracen meaning due to buckwheat imports from the Near East, uh, which led to its implementation as a signifier for Near Eastern peoples, or peoples from the Levant. Um, the program also highlights how representations of Near Easterners as black in medieval times could have been due to the color of buckwheat itself. Um, in this illustration, I, I uh, show how, uh, it is from 1400, um, I show how the Saracens were regarded as uh, uh, black in this particular um, illustration. Um, the point um, of the in incommensurability of depicted details of medieval narratives is highly illuminating and informs some of the arguments I have made already, and arguments I shall make later. Turk um, uh, is not wholly new, however. Urban II mentions it in his uh, speech, as discussed previously. There are many reasons as to why the transition from Saracen uh, uh, as the do dominant signifier of the inhabitant of the Near East to Turk started taking effect from the late Middle Ages. The principal one is that the Ottomans were establishing themselves as the new superpower uh, on the scene, having founded their state upon a theory of infinite expansion and annual war to advance uh, uh, their territories. Um, yeah, uh, moving on to the following section, and I have a map here which highlights uh, Barbary uh, um, uh, as part of uh, um, uh, uh, clearly showing Morocco as part of Barbary. Um, in, in this section, which I, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief so that I, I get to finish the rest of what I'm trying to say, um, um, I'll be just talking about how um, the barbarians and the Moors were also classed as Turks and not, not uh, entirely separate. Um, when it comes to North Africa, initially the distinction was between two categories, barbarians and Moors. But by the 16th century, they were dismissively divided in the English popular uh, imagination into Turks, who were part of the, uh, the empire, uh, and Moors who lived in or came from Morocco. Uh, Tinniswood goes on to explain that the distinction was not hard and fast. Both terms were loose, generic, and often interchangeable. Nevertheless, barbarians or Moors, all North Africans, um, like the Eastern Mediterraneans, were also called Turks, whether to denote Muslims or to mean a type um, uh, of Ottoman Turk, both which was often the case. 
since informed distinctions and understanding of the region were quite hazy. The term survived as a signifier of sorts until the 19th century when Thackeray visited John Frederick Lewis at his home in Cairo. He was surprised to find his friend dressed like a Turk. Nevertheless, Turk and its variants began to wither uh, away from the beginning of the 18th century with the publication of A Thousand and One Nights, as I'll explain in the next section. And from this point onwards, Arab starts taking place. Um, Like Turks, which ethnically refers to the inhabitants of Turkey, whether of old or new, but was used to universally mean uh, Near Eastern or Muslim or Arabs or people from the Near East, um, uh, um, Arabs refers ethnically to peoples from Arabia, which is the Arabian Peninsula uh, below the Levant, but came to be used as a universal term to refer to Near Easterners, or more specifically sometimes um, uh, the Muslims of the Near East, or sometimes just everybody. Um, in England, something um, similar to what was happening in France at the time was also taking place with the publication of um, uh, uh, the first translation of uh, um, A Thousand One Nights between 1704 and um, 1717. Uh, Gallant's text was translated in England by an anonymous Grub Street translator shortly after its publication in France. The English translator published it under the Arabian, inter, uh, uh, the Arabian Nights Entertainments as a title. The title, which does not reflect the meaning of Gallant's The Thousand and One Nights, is based on Gallant's assumption, rather than the English translators, that the stories were written by an Arabian author for an Arabian audience. In addition, Gallant was also ignorant of the geography of the Eastern Mediterranean, which he sold himself as an expert on. He uh, was referring, for instance, to some uh, towns and, uh, um, in, in the manuscript itself, in footnotes, as uh, look, uh, towns of Arabia, located in Arabia, which uh, obviously they, they were not like. For example, he mentions Alexandria as a town in Arabia, which, um, uh, as perhaps most, most of the audience uh, knows, it's a, a town in the, an, a Mediterranean town in the north coast of Egypt. Uh, this misconception was carried over by uh, uh, 19th and 20th century translators of the night, such as Edward uh, William Lane, Richard Burton, and T.E. Lawrence. After the British forces invaded Egypt in 1882, they started feeding aspects of British Orientalist ideology to the Egyptian public through British-controlled newspapers and journals. Some of these ideas shocked and disturbed the Egyptian public. British colonial forces expected and demanded from the Egyptians to identify themselves as Arabs, something which was taken further by the new pan-Arabist military regimes in the new uh, uh, in the 21st century. Today, there are many calls albeit amid understandable confusion and resistance from pan-Arabists for, the, uh, 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 for discuss, discarding this false Arab cloak and restoring the ancient and proud identities of the peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa. One example on this is an article by a Lebanese vicar, which went viral in the two lingua francas of the Eastern Mediterranean North Africa, classical Arabic and French. Um, and the article is titled, Nous ne sommes pas des Arabes, and um, uh, the author is Father uh, Theodoros Dawood of uh, Lebanon. Um, he asserts that uh, the Syrian, the Iraqi, the Egyptian, the uh, Lebanese, the Jordanian, and the Palestinian are not uh, Arab. And this was uh, the, uh, the Arab phrase was only like the Roman phrase or the uh, British phrase or the French phrase it was only a, 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 a phrase of colonialism. It's, it's, it, was, it doesn't define uh, the, these countries and does, it doesn't define these peoples. Um, as discussed earlier uh, in the paper, many academic texts have to be approached with caution, and I'm, I'm concluding here, uh, with caution when it comes to terminology, uh, due to the aforementioned colonial and pan-Arabist falsification. 
it is not uncommon to encounter a reference to prehistoric inhabitants of the Levant as Arabs, as we observed in, in, in Wheatcroft, or to come across the Spanish terms Moros and Moriscos, which are widely understood in English as Moors and uh, Moriscos, uh, translated incorrectly by the author of an academic paper on linguistics into Arabs and captives. Um, uh, similarly, due to the currency of the signifier today, uh, and I mean by that uh, the Arab signifier, dictionaries uh, uh, also are not far removed from corruption as we discussed previously. I believe I have demonstrated sufficiently here the progression of one signifier after another in reference to the inhabitants of the Near East in English imagination. The Saracen is the Turk, the Barbarian, the Moor, and the Arab. The same apparition reappearing in a new cloak every time. I hereby call for a systematic reconsideration and an academic revision of the way we refer to the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa um, and their inhabitants. Thank you.